When I was a kid in high school, I had several different jobs, sort of strange jobs along the way. And one wasn't so strange. I was a janitor for a while. I, uh, I, would, we, I worked for a janitorial company where we would clean car dealerships and doctor's offices and the CP rail yards, uh, their, their repair shop down there. The worst part about that job was that when I went to the do, do the doctor's office, I had to carry the vacuum cleaner into the doctor's office and in the same building was, a, was an arcade where all my buddies used to hang out. So every night when I'd walk in with my vacuum cleaner, they'd be like, ooh, is that an Electrolux? And stuff like that, so, yeah, it's very nice. Uh, so I did that job for several years. Um, somehow, too, I got, a, I got a job looking after floor hockey at my old elementary school for one spring. I'd go every Monday night or something and open the gym and a bunch of kids would come and play floor hockey. I don't remember how I got that job. But the strangest job I ever had as a kid was at this building. Uh, I don't know if you know this building, Grace might know it. It's the natatorium. It's the natatorium, exactly. The natatorium, the swimming pool in Moose Job. Uh, the natatorium was built in like 1905 or something like that. And uh, the main part, the main floor is the swimming pool part, but up on the second floor they had offices. And I don't exactly remember how I got this job. I think I got this job from a woman at church, she asked me to do this. But my job was to go to the natatorium on Tuesday nights and I would go in the front doors and up the stairs and I would go to this room right here and I would sit there. Now I think what was going on, if I remember correctly, I think what was going on was that there was supposed to be a meeting that was taking place there in that room, but the meeting had been moved to another day and another time and another place. And I don't know why they didn't just put a piece of paper on the window or something saying, please go to this other place, but they hired me to go and sit there on Tuesday nights in case anybody showed up for the meeting so I could tell them where the new meeting was. So you go up the stairs and you go into this little room and there's nothing in this room except one big table and about five chairs. And I would go there every Tuesday night and I'd sit there for two and a half hours with nothing to do. I'd look out the window and watch people jump off the diving board. I'd take a book and read for a while. I'd stare out the window at cars going by. I didn't know why I was there. I was there for two and a half hours. Guess how many people in the two months I did that job, guess how many people came to that room looking for whatever meeting was supposed to be taking place that night? Guess how many people came? None. <laughs> Nobody. And so most of the time I'd sit there thinking to myself, what am I doing here? Like, well, why am I here? There, I'm not doing, what am I doing? But I kept going because I was getting paid. So, but it was, it was, have you ever had a job where you just don't know what you're supposed to be doing and there's not much going on, but you show up because you're getting paid anyway, but you're kind of lost? That was every Tuesday night of one spring of my life at the natatorium. I, I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. I was just there. I tell you that story because I think sometimes Christians get left in that same spot. I think if we went around this room right now, you know what I mean, not only in terms of maybe you've had a job where you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and you kind of feel lost, but I think you know that in terms of your spiritual life as well. Because here's what often happens. Here's what I think often happens anyway in my observation. I think lots of times we get people excited about Christianity and about their faith and about God and what he's done and how great he is, and we start teaching them. And so we start telling them about God and we start reading the Bible with them and we start teaching them some things they need to know and people get excited and they want to know more. And so we teach them and eventually they come to the point where they decide they want to make a commitment to God. They want to give their lives to him or however you want to say that. And so we tell them, okay, here's what you need to do. And we start talking about faith and belief and confession and repentance and baptism. And so we teach people and get them all knowledgeable about God. And we say to them, if you really want to live for God, you need to bury your old self in baptism. You need to be risen to a new life. And so that's what we do. And we baptize people. And people come out of the water and they've got a new life and a new start and their sins have been washed away and they're all excited. And then 
they hit the end of the bridge. What, what now? What, what do I do now? We've instructed them up to that point. And then we kind of just say, well, now you're on your own. And I love this picture simply because I think lots of times I think that's where people are at. They've been baptized and saved, and they know that heaven is coming. Somewhere down the line, Christ is going to return and we're going to go home. I've got the first part and I've got the last part, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing right now. It's not that I don't want to do something. It's not that I don't want to help. It's not that I don't want to be faithful. It's just that I'm not sure what to do. What, what, what's next? And unfortunately, I think the church has been very poor about that middle part. I, I think the church has produced lots of material about the first part, how to become a Christian. We've got that part down pat. We don't know much about what the middle part is supposed to look like. Fortunately, though, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter does. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter writes to the early church and says, now that you are Christians, now that you've heard about God's love, now that you have heard about the empty tomb, here's what's next. And I want to give you the what's next part today. As I said, Peter's going to tell them who they are, he's going to tell them what they are to do, and he's going to tell them how to do it. And all of that is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. If you want to read with me, we'll read that little section, and then we'll come back to it and pick out the parts that I think are applicable to us. Peter, by the way, has just, been, just finished talking about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. This is the next part. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. If you don't get lost in that part, Jesus is just saying, or Peter's just saying, some people value Jesus and find their salvation in him. Other people stumble over him, they don't believe. He says, but you're the believers. So here's what you are. Verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. <sighs> Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's a lot of words. Lots of verses, lots of stuff, but it's actually really helpful to us. Peter tells them, first of all, who they are. And he tells them that in verses 5 and verses 9. And I want to just list the things and point them out to you because this is who he says they are, and this is then who we are as Christians today. First thing he says, you are living stones built into a spiritual house. He says, when you were baptized, when you, when you came to Christ, he took you as a living stone and put you into his spiritual temple. He has built you into the thing that he is doing. He has made you part of his plan. That's what happened when you were saved. You became part of the family, part of the building, part of the structure, part of the plan. The word I like most in that little phrase there is that you are a living stone. 
You are not just a dead piece of wood. You are not just a, a thing that just sits there and does nothing. You are a living stone, living implying that you are going to be active. Living things are growing. Living things produce other things. And so Peter says, you are a living stone built into a spiritual house. You are here to do something. You are here to be part of something. You are here to participate, not spectate. Peter's expectation, God's expectation, is that we are living stones, not just sitting stones. We're not just sitting around waiting for Jesus to return. Secondly, he says, you are a holy priesthood. The priesthood were the group of people who had access to God. In the old days, when, the, when you had a sin that needed to be forgiven, if you needed prayers said for yourself, you didn't do it yourself, you went to the priest, because the priest was the one who had special access to God. Peter now says that's not true any longer. Now, because you are baptized believers, you are now Christians, you are the priesthood. You yourselves have access to God right now. So your prayers are heard, your thoughts are heard, you have access to the king. That's who you are. He goes on with other descriptive words. He says, you're a chosen people. I like the word chosen there. He says, you are wanted, you are important, you are desired by God. He isn't accepting you because you begged him to. You've not twisted his arm, his arm behind his back, and he's like, okay, fine, I'll have you back. He has chosen you. You are a chosen people. Peter just keeps dumping out the expressions. He can't come up with enough of them to make it all. He can't come up with the right one, so he comes up with a bunch of them. He goes on. He says, now you're a royal priesthood. The next three are interesting. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. I like that last phrase in particular. You are a people belonging to God. He says, you have been chosen by him. You belong to him. The importance of, of who we are isn't based on how good we are. The importance of who we are isn't based on what we do, necessarily. We're important because we belong to God. That's an interesting thought. That's worth thinking about. That connection that we have makes everything else about us important and worthwhile. Let me illustrate it this way. This jet, at this moment, is sitting in an airstrip in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, this, this jet is sitting there, it went up for sale in January. This jet is stripped to the bones. There are no engines, there is no cockpit, there is nothing in it but the seats in the interior of it. It, it has been stripped of all its wiring. It has been stripped of anything of value. But this jet sold in January for $260,000. It, it will not move on its own, obviously. It'll have to be transported. There's nothing much left of it. But it sold for $260,000 because it once belonged to... Elvis, exactly. This is Elvis's jet. Elvis bought this jet back in 1976, and somebody's now acquired it, and even though there is nothing of value left in it, it's worth $260,000 to somebody. In fact, the guy who purchased it before and then sold it, he purchased it for $460,000, so there's your investment going the wrong way. But this jet is, in, is valuable simply because of who used to own it, who it belonged to. <coughs> And I think when Peter's trying to describe us, he says, you are now a people belonging to God. If you ever question your worth, if you ever question whether you've got anything to offer, if you ever question whether you've got anything to give, or whether anybody else is worth something, remember, we are people belonging to God. That's a beautiful thought. That brings us value. That's who we are. 
As Peter starts this out, he's struggling to, to tell them how important they are, how wonderful they are. That he's, he's struggling to give them an impression of the position they've been given. And I want you to notice this is all because of what Christ has done. This is, they haven't done anything yet. He says, God has chosen you. God has forgiven you. God has looked after you. God is making a home for you. You are his people, his priesthood, his nation. You've been chosen. That's who you are. That's a pretty nice message, isn't it? That's a pretty good reminder. But he goes on from there and not only tells them who they are, he then says, because of who you are, here's what you're going to do. He tells them in verses 5, again, and verses 9 and 10, he says three things about them, number, or two things about them. Number one, he says, you are God's people, and your job is to offer spiritual sacrifices. That sounds confusing. What on earth does that mean? But, but simply he's saying, you are here to give something. You're here to offer something. You're here to do something. Again, he doesn't see them as passive. He sees them as active. You are here to do something. What specifically are they supposed to do? We're told that in verses 9 and 10. He says, you are here to declare the praises of God. If you've ever wondered, what am I supposed to do now? That's the simple answer. And if you forget everything else about that, this whole sermon, here's what I want you to think about this week. My job as I go through my life this week is to declare the praises of God. My job is to tell people how great God is. Peter elaborates on that. He says, you're going to declare the praises of God, and you're going to tell people how he brought you from darkness to light. One of the, one of the most favorite um, illustrations of the change that's happened to us uh, in the Bible, one of the most uh, used illustrations is that we've gone from darkness to light. We've gone from not understanding, not seeing, groping around, not being able to figure out what we need, to we're in the light now. We can see. We, we understand. And he says that your job is to talk about how God has brought you from darkness to light. You're going to declare that to everybody you meet. Everywhere you go, you're going to tell people how great God is because he has saved you. He's from darkness to light. He saved you from your sins. He's forgiven you. He's done all these great things. Right, from darkness to light and how he's shown us mercy. I love that last word there too. He says, you used to be a people who were not shown mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Mercy is such a great word, and mercy is a word that's not used enough in church. I think if you went out on the streets and asked most people, what do you think about Christians? They would not be, the first word in their mouth would not be, they are merciful people. I think most of the time people see Christians as judgmental people, but that's not our message. That's not who we're supposed to be. Peter says, you are out to declare something. And what are you declaring? You're declaring how merciful God has been to you. How he's treated you better than you've ever deserved. And how he's waiting to be merciful to every single person you know. Everywhere you go. Your message is, we have a merciful, loving God who's willing to forgive and make you part of his family. He has chosen you. He's inviting you. That's our message. Peter says that if you want to know what you're supposed to be doing, you're supposed to be declaring the praises of God. In other words, you're supposed to be God's commercial. This week, you're supposed to be God's commercial, telling everyone how great he is. And that's really a good thing because commercials are powerful, right? Commercials get your attention sometimes. People wouldn't spend billions of dollars on commercials if they weren't. And I, 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 I remember one time, well, back when I was a kid, back when I was 12 years old, McDonald's came out with something they'd never come out with before. On uh, St. Patrick's Day, when I was 12 years old, McDonald's came out with the Shamrock Shake. When I was a kid, they 
brought that thing out and they advertised that thing for months ahead of time. They, they, every time I watch TV, there are people drinking shamrock shakes. There were people talking about shamrock shakes. Shamrock shakes are coming. You gotta try a shamrock shake. Every time I went, my kids at my school were so excited about it. We're getting a shamrock shake when they come out on the 17th. Are you going to get a shamrock? I became convinced that my life would be useless unless I got a shamrock shake on St. Patrick's Day at McDonald's because they made it sound so good. I bugged my mom and I bugged my grandparents. We never went to McDonald's ever, but we were going to McDonald's on St. Patrick's Day to get a shamrock shake. And so I bugged them enough that we actually did. And I remember going into the McDonald's on the mall parking lot, if you remember that, right? The old McDonald's, and you went in there, I went up to, I remember getting it, I remember drinking it and thinking, well, this isn't so good. <laughs> it was kind of a letdown. But my point being, that the commercial made it desirable. The commercial made it so I was convinced that that was the best thing in the entire world. I had to have a shamrock shake, and if I didn't get a shamrock shake, something was gonna be wrong. That, that's sort of the picture that Peter is saying. Peter's saying, I want you to go out, this is your job now, go out and show the goodness of God to the point where people think, I've gotta have what you've got. I've got to, I've got to try that. I've got to see what that's like. And they won't be disappointed the way I was with my milkshake. But you've got to be the commercial. The thing that makes them say, that's beautiful. I need that. Now again, unfortunately, sometimes churches have taken the wrong approach and made it so everybody says, I don't want anything like that. I don't want any part of that. If that's the way you are, if we've made that impression on people, we've made the wrong impression, that's not our job. We're not here to make enemies. We're here to be a commercial. Peter says, you're here to declare the praises of God. That's what you're here for. Not to point out other people's faults, you're here to declare God's goodness. That's your job. Now, at this point, you might be sitting here thinking, well, we haven't learned much yet. I mean, I think I knew all that part so far. But here's where the, the lesson becomes interesting to me anyway. Because I think in the next step is where it changes, where we've missed the point. Because now the question is, how do you do that? I think as a kid, when I was told that you are chosen by God, you're part of the family, you're part of the group, now you've got something to do, and your something to do is to go and tell people how great God is, the impression I always got is, you've got to go teach somebody. Right? Now you gotta teach somebody. Now you gotta, if you're a good Christian, now you've gotta take your Bible and you've gotta declare the praises of God and go teach somebody. And if you don't know how to teach somebody, you're kind of failing. And this is why I think most of us sit still and don't do anything, because I don't know if I can actually teach somebody. I don't know if I can actually show them how I got into my faith. I don't I don't know what to do. I don't want to mess it up. And so most of us just sit around and do nothing hoping somebody else teaches somebody. You want some good news this morning? You are the chosen people of God. You are a royal priesthood. You have a connection to God. You are to declare the praises of God. And you want to know how you're going to do it? By how you live. Your life is supposed to do that. And so Peter says in verses, in the, in the last of this reading, he says, the answer is you're not going to have to say it. You're going to demonstrate it. Look at verses 11 and 12. You're a chosen people. You go declare the praises of God. How are you going to do this? Verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires that war against your soul. Don't do the things you used to do. Don't go and do the things that are harming everybody else around you. Live a different way. What are you going to do? Live such good lives. Among the pagans. Pagan just means unbeliever. If you've got unbelieving friends, you don't have to take the Bible and jam it down their throat. You don't have to stand back and, and look down your nose at them and say, Oh, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis. If you just get it together, Dennis. No, no, no. What are you going to do? If you have an unbelieving friend, you're going to live such good lives among them. That though they accuse you of doing wrong, even if they think you're trying to get them some... It, he says, even though they might 
not know why you're doing it, they're going to see your good deeds and glorify God. That's your job. Your job is to go out and be the nicest, kindest, most forgiving, most wonderful, most helpful, most godly person anybody knows, in the best sense of the word. Not godly as in judgmental, not godly as in looking down my nose, but godly as in the loveliest, kindest, most merciful person there is. And here's the good news about that. Every single one of us can do that. You don't have to stand up in front of a group. You don't have to know 20,000 scriptures. You don't have to have memorized a whole spiel to say to people. You don't have to have every answer to every one of their questions. All you have to be is the kindest, nicest, warmest, best person they know. That is your job. That is what we're here for. The problem is sometimes we get off base. We start valuing the wrong things. But that's the part to value. Christian writer Bob Goff said the other day, I heard him say, in my family we don't talk about careers. We talk about character. Right? He says, I don't care what my kids do. I care who they are. I don't care what they make a living at. I care about how they live. You are going to be the kindest, nicest, best example of God's love to you ever. I love this passage because, again, I think it saves us from this problem. I think it saves us from just sitting around and waiting for Jesus to return. Because, actually, I do have something to do, and I have something I can do. In fact... This problem here leaves out a really big word in the scriptures, and the really big word is discipleship. A discipler is simply a follower, and when we actually follow Jesus by living our faith, others see it, and maybe they become followers too. Discipleship is the bridge part. We make a huge mistake as the church when we only emphasize salvation. Salvation is great. Salvation is the start. You are here, though, to be a disciple. You are here to follow. You are here to leave an example, to declare God's praise that others can see and maybe hear and follow as well. Our job is to be an example. Our job is to be kind. Our job is to love so that others see God and maybe love him too. Or to put it in the words of Jesus from Matthew, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. You are not useless. You are the children of the King. <laughs> you are not helpless. You are actually part of God's family. He's chosen you. He's empowered you. He's given you a job. And the job is go love others the way he loves them. The job is declare his praise by being the best people anyone knows. Not because you think you're the best, but because they think you're the best. Can you go and love somebody this week? And when they ask you why, tell them about the God who loves you. Brothers and sisters, that is what we're here for. If you have your communion supplies with you, we will now remember the hope that we have that gives us this ability. Again, we're not preaching ourselves. We don't do this because we're nice. We do this because God is nice. We are a reflection of what God has done for us. And, uh, and we need to show that to other people. So every week we remember what God has done for us, so we remember how we act to others. That's what we will do at this time, we'll remember Christ's sacrifice.
Christ was, uh, as you're doing the Last Supper, he gave us instruction. He gave us instruction to take the bread and remember his body, take the fruit of the vine, remember his blood that was sacrificed for us. As we do that here this morning, we turn our thoughts to the table to remember what Jesus has done for us. He took our sins and he died that we might be forgiven. I would like to read a little bit of uh, Isaiah 53. I've always found that to be, it's kind of a go-to to, as a reminder to what he experienced. It said, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's remember what Jesus has done for us as we partake of his wine. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that you have given us today that we might remember the body of Jesus as it hung on that cruel cross for our sins. We thank you now for this hope because it is a reminder. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. as we continue our remembrance here this morning, we give you thanks for the fruit of the vine, for the reminder of the blood that was shed on the cross for us. Guide us with your faith that we may do so in a way that is pleasing to you. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter says we get to participate in God's kingdom by loving those around us. May you go this week, and uh, whoever you see, whoever you're with, wherever you are, may you love them the way God would love them and declare his praises that way.